In this video presentation, I want to give you a really simple and short introduction on rural wireless communications. If you look at the wireless communication world today, oftentimes you will run into a sea of buzzwords. On the one side, uh, new technologies, uh, protocols, standards, and wireless hardware, they all emerge from the markets or academia every once in a while. And if you actually dive into the literature or articles, you will find all these new fancy terms and concepts uh, that are sometimes just really confusing. So for a typical farmer or even an electrical engineer graduate student like me, it's sometimes really hard uh, to determine what module or what protocol I need to use to do this type of, say, some type of experiment or tests. The reason is that we don't really have uh, a, a set of really essential concepts and criteria to based off of to determine uh, what protocol or module that we should use. So in this presentation, I want to simplify stuff a little. Uh, so in part one, I will give you some re really rudimental concepts and parameters in wireless communications to give you a background on what you need to pay attention to uh, for wireless communications and technologies. And in part two, uh, once we learn about these parameters, uh, I want to gather some data and then uh, gather the data around these parameters and give you a really straightforward visualization of these parameters. And in part three, I want to go through a step-by-step -step process to generate a comparison table in a heuristic way uh, to give you a method to select the wireless module or protocol that you want for your application. Let's take a look at some of the uh, essential wireless communication con concepts first. So for a basic communication system, uh, it typically consists of a transmitter and a receiver. So say uh, one person is a transmitter and the other person is a receiver. When one person speaks up, the other person will be able to receive the voice and hear it. But say all of a sudden these two people are um, pulled apart from each other. They can still see each other, but if they just use their regular uh, voice, the other person will not be able to hear it. And now the uh, one party actually needs a megaphone, say, to amplify uh, the person's voice so that the other one can hear it. And that's what a row of antenna does. It actually amplifies the signal of the transmitter so that the receiver has a better chance of receiving it. And the other really big part uh, of a communication system is the environment that the transmitter and the receiver uh, are sitting in. Uh, for a city, of course, you have a lot of obst obstacles. You have cars, you have different architecture, you have people generating different amounts of noise. Uh, and then in the rural area, uh, things are a little bit different. Things are a, lo a lot more open. However, you still need to consider aspects like uh, topography, uh, vegetation. It depends on what type of crops that you are growing and uh, such and such. On the receiver side, a very important characteristic is the receiver sensitivity. It is the power of the weakest signal the receiver can detect. It is, uh, by some means, a good measure of the goodness of the receiver. On the transmitter's end, a very important aspect is called the transmitter power. It is uh, typically defined as the total net output power of the transmitter. And if you go into any data sheet, any decent data sheet with a uh, of a RF module that has a transmitter, you will run into these uh, different types of units. And these units can be really confusing even for engineers. So let's sort it out a little bit. So for MW, it stands for milliwatts. It is really common. It is written on your electric bill. It is a measurement of power and a thousand milliwatts is one watt. 
and for db it is all also really common it's called the a, a decibel it is a unit uh, to uh, express the ratio of uh, two power and dbm stands for uh, the decibel milliwatts it's actually a, a unit to express a quantity that's in relation to uh, the measurement power in milliwatts and dbi and dbd is uh, less common uh, they actually a, uh, stands for the forward gain of a isotropic or a dipole antenna so uh, when you have a transmitter it's usually sometimes it comes with an uh, antenna and that's the uh, it specifies uh, what antenna this transmitter use and uh, the gain of that particular antenna typically you will have two types of antennas one is called the uh, directional antennas and the other one is called omnidirectional antennas and one thing to point out is that antennas uh, do not add energy they actually focus the energy together so that it amplifies the power of the signal and then eventually emit the signal into the medium from the antenna and by looking at the transmitter power that we defined earlier in a more rigorous ter term uh, we can actually define two set of uh, output power so the conducted is equal to the output power of the transmitter however the EI RP which stands for effective isotropic radiated power is actually the power uh, when uh, the signal leaves the antenna so it is the transmitter power plus the antenna gain and that is uh, the total net, net output power that we defined earlier an important aspect in terms of environment is called a Fresnel zone as highlighted in this example you have a BLE transmitter and a, a receiver set up at a certain height for its antennas and they constitute the first Fresnel zone there are a second and third but only uh, the first zone is considered as, a, as you can see um, there is a direct line of sight path to allow the direct BLE signal to pass through this zone uh, without any obstacles however on the ground is a natural reflector and it generates a reflected signal from the transmitter to the receiver and as you could imagine if the out of phase of uh, these two signals uh, at the right moment these two signals on uh, their amplitude can completely cancel each other and on the receiver and you will receive nothing so uh, typical rule of thumb is that um, it is acceptable that within 60% uh, of the radius of the zone 1 there's no obstacles and then um, the, rec uh, the signal received at the receiver end should be pretty reasonable having introduced these concepts um, we can actually talk about a concept called link budget that actually put everything in one picture and before going to the details let me give you an analogy first say I want to travel from Purdue University to Chicago and initially I'm sitting on half tank of gas and after driving on the freeway for 10 minutes I thought okay I don't want to take my chance to run out of gas let me just get filled up real quick and that's what I did and by the time that I got to Chicago I'm sitting on a little bit less than a quarter uh, of a tank of gas and this planning of fuel level is awfully like what video engineers does um, to estimate how much um, power budget they need to have to have a signal to arrive at the receiver end successfully and this margin in between the uh, receiver power and the receiver sensitivity is called typically um, defined as the link budget and in order to maximize the range in between the transmitter and the receiver there are a few things that you can do uh, first you can of course increase the transmitter power and second you can definitely try to improve the receiver sensitivity um, to lower it to a uh, 
uh, another value and of course you can try to increase the antenna gain by putting uh, a much more uh, powerful antenna to uh, amplify the signal that you want to send and the other thing that you can do is you can try to avoid the obstacles try to point your antenna and transmitter in a direction that has a direct line of uh, line of sight to your receiver okay now you may wonder all right now you introduce all these concepts uh, to confuse us but what are some of the things that i can do uh, to determine say uh, i want to recommend a wireless module to my clients or i want to do my own research to do a test deployment uh, for a certain sensor how do i determine uh, the goodness or the effectiveness of these modules and uh, how do i uh, see, uh, look at these parameters and determine okay what are the effects on the power and current consumptions which will lead me to determine whether these sensors or modules need to be battery or outlet powered are there any uh, difference um, these parameters make in terms of standards that will result in different data rates and uh, we also talked about link budget and range how are these gonna uh, help me to uh, have a rough estimate uh, of uh, the range uh, uh, is, is this gonna cover all of, of uh, my field these are really good questions and uh, I will hope uh, I hope I will answer them in the next uh, two parts of my presentation. There is a saying that a picture worth a thousand words. So in this part of the presentation, I will try to uh, provide you with a really simple method to gather around some data and visualize um, the parameters that we learned in part one uh, of this presentation. The visualization takes uh, three steps. Uh, step one is to gather data, and then step two is that, of course, for any type of data processing or visualization, you need to clean your data. And then finally, um, after we find all the parameters and data that we want, we can visualize them. So in terms of data gathering, I uh, want to find data for these five protocols, uh, LoRa, BLE, uh, cellular, Wi-Fi, and Zigbee. They all have uh, different, pretty different characteristics, although, say, BLE, Zigbee, and uh, they have a pretty similar range and uh, data rates, but we will see how the data, data visualizations can help us identify any difference within these five different protocols. These are the parameters uh, that we want to collect from different modules or protocols. Um, they are data rate, sensitivity, transmitter power, and uh, uh, link budget. Over here, we have a really non-rigorous way to define a link budget. Typically, a link budget is the margin in between the uh, receiver power and the sensitivity, the difference in between the receiver power and the sensitivity. And over here, we assume that the uh, transmitter power uh, and the receiver power are the same and hence our non-rigorous way to define the link budget is transmitter power minus the sensitivity and we also want to investigate the uh, current consumption in both trans transmission and the receiving mode to uh, look at uh, the power scenario for um, different modules um, there are many different ways that we can gather this data, but I actually took a very straightforward approach to go on to a large electronic components uh, selling uh, website. Uh, and uh, I type in, say, for cellular modules and it will return all the cell modules and their specifications uh, in, the, uh, in the spreadsheet. So I download this spreadsheet uh, to my computer and then it contains uh, all the uh, columns um, that I want and also that I don't want. So I also wrote a Python script to remove these columns and extract the values that I need for further visualizations. And a typical CSV file um, usually contains, um, these are really popular modules that we want to investigate. So a typical 
um, a spreadsheet usually contains say uh, one to two hundred uh, rows of uh, data. After we collected uh, the parameter values, uh, we uh, are able to uh, generate a series of visualizations and look at uh, uh, these different wireless modules under different protocols. And uh, this first one is uh, data rate versus the sensitivity. And as you can see, if we just look at the data rate, uh, the x-axis of this plot, uh, the Wi-Fi module pretty much dominates the high data rate region and uh, the Bluetooth and uh, the Zigbee modules are kind of in the middle and uh, for a uh, lower module it's uh, its data rate uh, their data rates are actually on the lower end however on the other hand if you look at the y-axis which is the sensitivity uh, the lower modules have really good sensitivity values which means that they can place further apart much further apart from um, their transmitters in comparison to uh, uh, modules uh, under other protocols. An interesting outlier is uh, the uh, a newer uh, cellular protocol called the uh, 4G LTE MB IoT. It offers uh, comparable sensitivity to um, LoRa and uh, with a fairly reasonable data rate. And then in this plot, which is the data rate versus the link budget, uh, it's no surprise that um, the LoRa modules have the best um, link budget because their uh, sensitivity values are so low, which means they are pretty good. And uh, for uh, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, and Bluetooth, they are probably um, more or less the same. They stayed in between like 90 to 130 dBm. Uh, cellular is a, a little bit better and uh, LoRa, as I said before, they are the best in terms of uh, link budget. And in this set of plots, uh, it kind of brings out the theme um, in visualizing these parameter values and we need to look at them side by side. If you want to look at the right plot first, say for example, let's pick uh, the LoRa modules. Their sensitivity values are really good, uh, they're really low, and then their average current consumptions in both uh, the TX and RX modes are pretty low. Like in terms, um, uh, it's like less than 200 uh, milliamps at maximum. Uh, however, if you look at their data rate on the left, uh, they kind of suffer a lot. Like they like at maximum, they can reach what like a typical um, Bluetooth module can reach. Um, but if you look at say, let's pick Wi-Fi modules uh, on the uh, left plot, their data rate pretty much dominates. They have the highest data rate of pretty much all modules on uh, on average. But in terms of its current consumption, they are pretty power hunger. They range in between. 100 to uh, say all the way up to a little bit over 400 milliamps. So the central theme is that a lot of uh, choosing what a right uh, wireless module is, is trade-offs. So for um, lower modules, they are really good in receiving uh, data uh, because of their sensitivity. That means two different nodes can place really far apart from each other, but their data rate is low. That means you cannot transmit, say, a movie or a big chunk of data from one node to the other. And then on the other hand, for the Wi-Fi module, um, they are power hunger. It means that you do not want to just have them be on constantly. Uh, you can have them on a schedule and they can transmit a fairly large file in a short time. Uh, but it will cost you a lot of power in doing that. So um, what I want to uh, preach is that uh, choosing a wireless module is all about trade-offs. You need to consider um, what your scenario is, what your application is, and have a, a really rough estimate of, uh, say, the data rate 
and uh, the range that you want and then these parameters can actually help you narrow down what wireless modules or technology that you want to deploy on your field and then in the next part the final part of my presentation I will talk about uh, how you can generate uh, and calculate some of these parameters uh, by hand by looking at the data sheets of uh, uh, these modules in this last part of my presentation I want to walk you through a step-by-step -step process to choose a wireless module or protocol based on a real-life deployment scenario in a heuristic approach our strategy can be broken down into four steps. The first step is picking some modules for comparison. The second is that we will inspect the data sheets of these modules. And from that, we will either record uh, some given values and compute some parameters that we need to finally compare them according to a real life scenario. These are the modules that we picked. Uh, they are from four different protocols, BLE, ZigBee, LoRa, and Wi-Fi, and they are all pretty widely available low-cost modules. And for uh, parameter recording and computation step, we set up this empty table for each uh, module and uh, for us to fill in these different parameters. Uh, we are interested in the data rate, the communication range, the average uh, current consumption, uh, in TX mode and we want to either compute or just uh, copy and paste uh, the data sheet values in these table. For range calculation we use a slightly modified free space path loss model. A free space path loss model means that once the signal leaves the antenna it will experience loss in the obstacle free and the line of sight path to travel uh, to the receiver and uh, our formula is modified by uh, subtracting a constant that ac accounts for uh, deployment scenario in the rural area which is uh, minus 30 db and as you can see after just a little bit of uh, uh, algebra uh, you can obtain the uh, uh, range uh, based on two parameters one is the link budget and the other one is the uh, baseband frequency of the wireless protocol that uh, we want to use. And now for an example, say for the XB3 Pro module, we looked at its data sheet and then it already specify all the parameters that we want, like for the line of sight range, the RF data rate, and also the operating current in transmission. Uh, then we just copy and paste these in and write them all down in the table that we set up. Um, but say for some modules, um, these parameters are not tested or they do not want to specify it in that much detail, which happens all the time. Uh, what we do, what we can do is that uh, we will just gather this information and try to compute these parameters on our own. So say for this BLE module, um, it has a uh, typical, uh, it has a maximum output power, which is 8 dBm, that's a given, so we can write that down. And then it has four different sets of data rate, which maps, which should map onto four different sets of range. So what we do is that we will gather around the uh, um, transmitting power from uh, these four different data rates, and then from these values uh, that's given in this uh, um, data sheet, we can compute first our link budgets. And from that, since the uh, BLE is, uh, uh, has a fixed um, frequency, we can compute its uh, communication range. We can follow the same procedure uh, in computing the uh, current consumption in transmit mode. Um, for this BLE module, uh, the uh, average power consumption, the current draw is not given, but what we can do is that we will look at all the uh, um, TX only current uh, for different modes and then sum them up together and take the average and that will give us uh, 5 milliamp in total. 
and we can do that uh, for the uh, LoRa module and the uh, Wi-Fi module in the same way. However, the LoRa module, um, they have a really nice calculator for like SimTech. Uh, we just plug in values and it will give us the range and uh, the power consumption. And then we have a complete setup table that's either filled by just data sheet specified values or our own computed values. Now we can actually use this table to uh, narrow down uh, the wireless modules or protocols that we want to use given a uh, real life scenario. And say I want to deploy some weather stations, I want to test them out in two of my fields, and the total area is around 160 acres, they are right next to each other, and no data uh, will be uploaded to my gateway device once per day, and I want the nodes to last for at least four months on a 1000 milliamp hour battery. At first glance, it seems to be these numbers seems to be really arbitrary, and I have no idea how these parameters can relate to the parameters that I generate in the table. But by looking at these numbers, we can actually translate them into something that we can understand and relate to our to the tables that we generated. Um, say for this 160 acres of fields. It roughly covers around uh, 647,000 meters squared uh, worth of field, which roughly covers a range of uh, 804 meters. And then going back to our tables, you can immediately emil eliminate the BLE and Wi Fi module uh, because their range is nowhere even close to the range that we want to uh, specify. So that left us with uh, just the, uh, uh, the XB module and the LoRa module. And then if we look at uh, the data uploading scheme, uh, they say uh, it says the node data should be only uploaded, uploaded once per day and it needs to last four months. What they translate to is that say it's only active for about five minutes per day to tra transmit on the data that's uh, the, the module has collected. That's roughly uh, 1 12th uh, of an hour per day. And then uh, for uh, four months, that means it's roughly 120 days. And then um, for, a, um, uh, for the power constraint that we have, a thousand milliamp hour battery, given the average power consumption in only the TX mode, that means it will last us for about 7 and 11 hours for the XB and the LoRa module. Um, and then if you times that, if you divide that by um, uh, 1 12th, which is times by 12, it will give us, um, for XB module, it's 85 days. And for the lower module, it's 132 days. And since we need uh, uh, roughly 120 days, the lower module wins. And that's how we actually uh, got uh, to use this table to help us narrow down uh, to a specific wireless module and protocol based on a real life scenario. In summary to this uh, three-part presentation, uh, the main takeaway message is that uh, choosing a wireless module or protocol depends on a few parameters uh, that are pretty easy to understand and you can actually do some hands-on work to visualize and uh, do some very basic comparisons. So these parameters can be uh, related to TX, RX power, sensitivity, uh, power data rate constraints, uh, range, and the environment that your transmitter or receiver are sitting in. And it's really not about a newer technology is better. It's all about um, how your deployment scenario is and, uh, and these uh, different aspects uh, that you want to put uh, into your uh, transmitter and receiver. So I hope this presentation will help you in uh, identify um, 
in addressing a lot of your uh, confusions and concerns in uh, wireless communication world. And uh, thanks for listening.